going on in Ukraine. And um, of course, as members of a medical community, you know, we, we care very deeply about human um, life and health and suffering. It's, it's sort of what we do. So, um, and, and of course, there's nothing uh, that affects that um, more than, than war and, and what's happening now. So um, in, in a lot of ways, we, we feel powerless, but at least we can uh, come together and, um, and think of the people who are suffering and do, do just a little bit to help out some of the people nearby who, who are helping hands on. <laughs> so um, thank you for being here. Uh, we'll post the chat, uh, the link to the um, contribution page in the chat if anybody wants to kind of continue to spread the word and um, um, we can talk about talk about a patient, uh, learn some things, be together and, um, and commemorate um, and be present for, for those who, who can't be with us. Um, so I heard, uh, Gurleen, you had a case for us? Yep, I have a case. Um, and since we're such a, a small, intimate group, um, I hope we can sort of all, all participate. Um, so Steph and I will keep the chat open, but I also um, would, we'd love people to just uh, unmute or stay unmuted and uh, just throw out any thoughts at any point you have um, any questions about anything that um, any new kind of data points or data that comes out that you're unsure of what to make of? Um, share any just teaching points you want to share that that are your favorite pearls on on whatever topic might come up, um, and hopefully we can have a um, a good group discussion since um, uh, this is a special late evening uh, VMR. And I see we have one of the newly matched interns on Franco. Congrats! Woo! Congratulations, Thank you. Franco. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm so happy. It's amazing. Congratulations. Welcome. And Ravi, great to see you. Saw so you just uh, signed on as well. Great to have you guys here. <coughs> I'm really excited for Gurleen's case. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited with this idea Zavin had of just opening it to the group, kind of really free flowing. It's kind of fun to be here with you guys and um, yeah, get a chance to just group think through this one together. So we'll turn it over to Gurleen. Do you want to, um, I think probably most people know you, but do you want to just say hi and. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Gurleen. Nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces as well. Um, I'm currently an intern at Brigham in Boston and really excited to present this case and for Secreti and Maria for organizing this platform to commemorate what's happening in Ukraine and everything that they're going through. Gurleen, I'll never forget, you You went to med school in my hometown, so I- Yeah, I remember Albany Med. Yeah, special, special connection with that geography. All right, we're ready. Thanks to Promise for scribing. Okay, so I have, this is a 70 year old male who presents with around four weeks of fever, chills, sweats, fatigue, and malaise. So around four weeks ago, he began experiencing chills requiring extra blankets, even though his thermostat was set pretty high. He was having rigors and drenching night sweats. He initially didn't have an elevated temperature, but around one week ago, he began having low grade fevers. He's been feeling like unusually fatigued, taking more naps during the day than he normally takes. He's very active at baseline, like walks more than 10,000 steps a day, but during these past, past month has barely been able to walk like half of that amount. He's lost appetite, skipping meals, maybe lost a few pounds, has felt some heavy pressure over, over his head that resolves with Tylenol. So for these symptoms, for his fevers, he saw his PCP, and somehow in that workup, they got a urine culture that grew aer aerococcus. The UA itself had showed hematuria without any pyuria. He said he maybe has some slight burning on urination, notes some baseline urinary frequency and attributes it to intentionally drinking lots of water. 
So he took a dose of um, trimethoprim sulfamethoxal and then was recommended to be evaluated in the ED for his constitutional symptoms. So that's what I have for the first aliquot. What an aliquot too. <laughs> um, Excuse me. Just uh, so Steph's voice, as well as the cough that will uh, no doubt continue to make an appearance. I'm sorry. Uh, is a resolving uh, uh, viral syndrome, uh, but need, no need to worry about our dear Steph. She's, she's going to be okay as uh, she's on the bed, um, <laughs> as opposed to this guy. Yeah. So um, what, what are just some thoughts that people want to... Um, throw out and um, everyone hopefully is looking at the chat, but uh, if, if people want to kind of expand um, uh, on anything, uh, please, please speak up too. The one thing that I know, and I put this in the chat as well, but it's interesting that he's, you know, having these chills and that he's look, looks as though he's writering, but has maybe had low grade fevers at best. Like, I mean, when I, you know, I was in, I was inpatient for the last, uh, for this last week, and I had a uh, patient, even though it was on heat, where, you know, I saw this patient, like, ride her in front of my eyes, and sure enough, she had a decently high-grade fever, um, but it just seems so weird that, you know, and also the fact that he has, you know, dysuria, all the classic hallmarks of a, um, of a cystitis that could possibly be pylo, and yet not really fevering all that much. So something is off and I don't know what. Um, Drew, you, you, you bring up a, um, you know, an interesting observation there, a possible, you know, what seems like a disconnect. And just so that we, you know, we're all on the same page in terms of, you know, what the, what the pathophysiology is like here. So if you, you know, if you take some lipopolysaccharide, some gram negative rods and inject it into my vein right now, um, I will have a pretty immediate sort of uh, response of my immune system that will start to ramp up TNF alpha and other inflammatory cytokines that will essentially reset my hypothalamic temperature set point, right? And try to make my body have a fever. Um, and there was a really fascinating clinical or uh, curious clinicians podcast episode about this topic where um, Avi Cooper emphasized, you know, the how interesting it is that like fever, the fact that like all mammals and even like cold blooded animals like get fever and it is persistently evolutionarily preserved in so many species and so many branches of uh, of animals, that it absolutely must be adaptive, right? There is something we gain by, by creating this fever. And there's a whole sort of set of mechanisms that, that by which uh, fever can be potentially helpful in the setting of infection. But the point is, again, that's what our body does, right? It tries to elevate the temperature. And one of the ways that we elevate our temperature is by using a lot of muscles, shivering, right? And rigors, which, which are defined as sort of uncontrollable, you know, shaking chills. One of the interesting definitions is that you couldn't drink a cup of water when you're having rigors mm. without spilling it. Whereas if you're having just a little bit of chills, right, or you're just like cold, you could still, you know, manage. But rigors, that's one of the sort of, obviously, it's a continuum, right? Um, so... But interesting, here's an interesting thing, Drew, that while you're <laughs> actually rigoring, your temperature could still be normal. But in fact, that is the time when you have, you know, lipopolysaccharide or a wave of bacteremia or whatever. So that's the time to get blood cultures, but your temperature could still be normal at that time. And how much your temperature actually ends up reaching or peaking I guess depends on how long you riger, what that hypothalamic set point is as defined potentially by how quickly your immune system neutrophils, et cetera, may or may not clear the triggering wave that was causing the rigors. 
So the height of the fever, you know, may or may not reach a certain thing that, you know, kind of impresses us or not, but it doesn't mean the trigger wasn't there, right? And I think the height that you reach also depends <coughs> on how low you started. So one of the definitions of fever isn't just the absolute, uh, you know, temperature that you reach, but how much of a delta, um, you know, is created from, from a given baseline. All that to say that, you know, I, I agree that it's maybe not, uh, you know, it stands out as a bit unusual, Dhruv. It doesn't make me any more reassured that this patient isn't, I don't know, bacteremic or has pilo or some serious um, infection. Sorry, that was a bit, bit of a tangent, but I was, I was recently very impressed and learned a lot from that uh, episode. Um, so I wanted to share some, some of those fun facts. I think the one other fever comment I'll make is, um, you know, what, what, L, what, what drops a, a temperature lower than it might be in other circumstances. And um, the two common things we see, right, are two common medications. He's taking an antipyretic now, Tylenol for the headache, but that may be having an impact on how high his fevers get. We don't know his med list yet. Um, certainly steroids and other anti-inflammatory drugs are very antipyretic as well. Um, and then again, as you're older, right, that we talked about the hypothalamic set point, just what your baseline temperature is and thus your fever response from that baseline can be variable. So I think many compelling reasons that we don't always stick to the 100.4 and greater, we're talking in Fahrenheit, 38 degrees Celsius, when we're actually worried about someone, right? There's so many factors and this guy's clearly sick. I'll say one thing, Gerlene, I, I really um, applaud in your history is just giving a brief sense of how functional this guy is. To walk 10,000 steps a day, I don't think, even though we're both on service um, at one of our bigger hospitals, I don't think I walked 10,000 steps today. So this is a guy um, who has you know, pretty good physical reserve, who's getting quite sick. I'll also make a comment. I'm, I'm impressed that he's gone four weeks feeling like this, but credit to his baseline health, I think that he's gone this long without feeling unwell enough to seek care. Certainly we could imagine another 70 year old gentleman with many other comorbidities who much more quickly than four weeks is getting quite sick and unable to function and, and actually coming in. Um, Drew, in the chat, you're, you're bringing up this organism, right? He actually has a positive culture pretty early in his course. And I wanna just ask the group, um, what do we know about Aerococcus? Cause I will say, I do not know much. Anyone else um, <coughs> have any insights or want to Google kind of more information about that? It takes, a, it takes a second to Google. Yeah, right? it takes a if second type to Google. G-O-O-G. Um, and Dhruv, um, Dhruv mentioned uh, that he was worried about Pilo. And I'm curious if... Um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll get to it in the exam and stuff. I guess we're, we're sort of like making a foregone conclusion that um, this seems to be, you know, there's urinary tract symptoms, right? We have a positive uh, culture. We have some bleeding in a urinary tract, which can happen with inflammation. Um, and then in this, we're dealing with an infectious syndrome locally and then in seemingly infectious syndrome systemically, so it must all be related, right? That's sort of like the simplest explanation, sure. being Akami. Um, <coughs> so promise, uh, thank you. Uh, it seems like a, it is a urinary tract pathogen. Um, Sema and Alexander are linking some uh, articles. Um, 
previously misidentified as strep. The emerging cause of urinary tract infection in older adults with multimorbidity and neurologic cancer, neither of which our patient has that we know of yet. Um, I'm curious if, you know, so Dhruv mentioned pilo. Um, Dhruv, why did you like, why, why, why did you invoke kind of, you know, he has symptoms of, of cystitis, right? Why, why invoke pilo? Because patients starting to have more systemic symptoms, like um, even though it's low grade fever, it's still fevers, rigoring. Um, and usually with just a simple cystitis, you don't get those systemic symptoms. So just being, uh, uh, again, just having a case of this on the, um, on the pediatric floor, you know, once you get, once you get a fever, once you get a fever, uh, you know, a febrile UTI, um, at least in, uh, you know, in this patient's case, we can probably call it pilo until proven otherwise. Um, usually, you'd, uh, you know, you'd get a CT to try and figure out what like, happened the inflammation of the kidneys, but, um, you know, honestly, don't really need to, and especially in kids, you don't, um, because you don't do any sort of like, or you try to avoid radiation exposure if you can. Um, and I remember that we, I remember this, the teaching point, because when we were getting an ultra, a uh, renal ultrasound for this kid, when she was not getting better, I made the mistake of putting in my note that we were getting it to, uh, to look for pilo. No, that imaging is basically to look for any sort of renal abscesses. Um, the fact that the patient is febrile already has a positive urine culture makes it pilo by definition. Great point. Great point. Should we get some, some more information, Gurley? Yeah, I just want to yeah. say, I'll very briefly say, same as putting some interesting things about aerococcus. And I think um, with the teaching points that you're making with this organism, actually putting a thread in there um, that could this infection, and again, we're assuming this is infection, I think because of how quickly this has happened, could it actually be elsewhere? And either the urine culture perhaps is unrelated, or I just want to point out this, um, some of these articles that you guys have pulled up, talk about more systemic infections from aerococcus, including endocarditis. And it just um, reminded me that certain organisms in the urine, I think more commonly, right, what we see is staph aureus, very often, and if there's not already a foreign body in the bladder, a Foley catheter, for example, really, really thinking about where did that come from? Did it originate in the bladder or did it actually come from, um, spread from elsewhere? So I think as we think about this man who's quite systemically ill, we have a signal in the GU system, um, but are we in fact seeing something show up in the bladder that has spread there from elsewhere? We'll see perhaps later on in the exam if we get signals in other organ systems. Gurleen, would love right. to get more info. Yeah, so in terms of um, some more information, so no chest pain, shortness of breath, cough, sore throat, sinusitis, like symptoms, no nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, no rashes, no vision changes or jaw claudication. He's had some pains in his shoulders and upper arms bilaterally, maybe slightly more severe on one side than the other, but no weakness or impaired mobility. The, these symptoms improve with Tylenol, um, usually occur when he has the fevers, the low grade fevers, the bilateral pains. He's vaccinated for COVID, no sick contacts. He spends around six months of the year in Florida, the rest in Massachusetts has traveled to New York and Maine earlier this year, but otherwise no other travels, no other outdoor activities, no known tick exposures, um, no water exposures or pets or exposures to animals or livestock. In terms of his past medical history, he has a history of asthma, type two diabetes that's well controlled with a last hemoglobin A1C of 6.7, um, has a history of CKD stage three, hypothyroidism, hypertension and hyperlipidemia. In terms of medications, he's on albuterol, amlodipine, aspirin, impagliflozin, 
hydrochlorothiazide, levothyroxine, lisinopril, metformin, metoprolol, resuvastatin, and a pulmonary core inhaler. So basically a lot of medications for his chronic conditions. For social history, he was born in India, came to the United States around 20 years ago, where he has a remote smoking history in the past. Otherwise, no significant alcohol use or recreational drug use. No history of cancer or autoimmune diseases in his family. And then once we get that up on the board, I can give the uh, physical exam for this aliquot as well. So it, his temperature on exam initial is 98.8, but during his hospitalization, the first few days, he has documented fevers up to 103. Heart rate is 104, blood pressure 108 over 58 respiratory rate 18, and setting 98% on room air. Generally, he's in no acute distress, normal appearance for HENT exam, no cervical lymphadenopathy, um, no icterus, pupils are equal around reactive. Cardiovascular exam is completely normal. Pulmonary exam is completely normal. Abdomen exam is completely normal. No appreciable splenomegaly noted. Skin is warm, dry, no rashes anywhere. For MSK, he has some or he, sorry, he has no tenderness to palpation over his shoulders or his arms. It's five out of five strengths bilaterally and no focal neuro deficit. So overall, no, basically no abnormalities in the physical exam. And that's what I have for the second aliquot. What questions do, does everybody have for Gurleen or for me and Steph? Gail's no recent COVID infection. No COVID, yeah. And Gail, just your your point in general about taking a step back, right? We've been working with infection as a likely diagnosis, but um, extremely important, right? To think of those other categories that can cause systemic inflammation like this as you're teaching us in the chat. Um, um, Immune status is a really good question. So far we've gotten from Gurleen, uh, you said his diabetes is well controlled. Really, really pertinent thing to mention, right? We would think of his risk for um, uh, many infections, right? Higher in the setting of uncontrolled diabetes. But it seems like other than that, correct me if I'm wrong, Gurleen, um, he's immune competent, right? Yep, mm -hmm. yeah, immune competent. <clears throat> Thanks, Gail. Gurleen, were his um, flanks tender at all to percussion? Not, what, not what's noted. So I met this patient as an outpatient a few months after the initial hospitalization in a subspecialty clinic that I won't name right now, but um, in documentation, there was no abnormality, <laughs> no, no CVA tenderness. I gotcha. So, you know, I, it, it, to me, it's... Um, it's a helpful kind of thing to, to check with here, um, you know, relevant to what Drew was saying earlier is that um, if there is systemic illness with a urinary tract infection, most commonly there's at least some ascending infection and in pyelonephritis. And again, you can make that diagnosis clinically just by someone having a UTI and then being tender in the back, um, in, you know, when you, when you tap over the, you know, either kidney when when someone is systemically ill, you think from a UTI, and they don't seem to have pyelonephritis. They don't have flank pain. They're not tender when you tap. Does anybody think of any other kind of complication of a UTI? Any other organ that might be involved? Gail, exactly. So the prostate, um, whereas, you know, the bladder wall is, you know, has a very specialized epithelium 
um, that protects any old thing that's in the urine from getting in the blood. The prostate is super, super vascular and is not separated from, from the urine very well. Um, and yeah, when you have you know, a sick person, a sick man uh, who seems to have a UTI and doesn't seem to have pylo, they very often have prostatitis. The diagnosis of which is important to be able to determine appropriately the type of antibiotic that has better prostate penetration. Uh, usually a longer course of antibiotics to cure, <coughs> cure the prostatitis. And then not to miss a complication of prostatitis that may not resolve with antibiotics alone, which is prostatic abscesses, which sometimes need drainage. And I would say that like out of every month that I spend at the VA, there's at least one case of acute bacterial prostatitis that, that we, we find and have to manage sort of in some of these um, uh, special ways. So it's important to think about. Um, the other thing that came to mind is, um, you know, anytime you, there's a species that grows that you've never heard of, um, very often <laughs> you haven't heard of it because it's not that commonly a human pathogen. And it is, um, and, and those isolates very often are, you know, like just accidental findings. So um, that along with the fact that, um, again, the time course of four weeks is a bit odd. The fact that the person seems to be sick from a UTI and we haven't yet found out like, why he's that sick from this UTI. Again, maybe there's a renal abscess. Um, maybe there's prostatitis and we can, we can think about looking for those things. But again, what if this, this UTI is either, uh, you know, uh, not a, a real infection or a, a, just an accidental finding, a secondary complication of some systemic illness, some, you know, what if this is the infectious presentation of leukemia, right? Um, or of some other immunocompromising state. So, so I think there's already a few flavors of that that um, might raise some eyebrows, the, the atypical pathogen, as well as the somewhat atypical presentation in terms of severity of illness and time course. Um, that, that should make us kind of be on the lookout for any additional kind of red flags that pop up. And I guess with that in mind, I'll say, I'm curious if up for others, the, this kind of review of systems of shoulder and upper arm pain on both sides um, stands out to me as a little odd. Now, I don't think we would have been surprised with fevers and chills if we heard he had general myalgias, right? He felt achy or generally asthenic. Um, but it stands out to me, right? It's a very focal part of his body that has discomfort. So I actually want to pose to the group, if we frame this, reframe this a moment as fevers and chills, and then kind of bilateral upper extremity discomfort, what other categories and diagnoses come to mind? Because I think this may be something we can use with our thinking in order to, um, just as Avin said, kind of maybe look outside the box that we're looking of this potential urinary infection. So same as mentioning, right, inflammatory syndrome of polymyalgia rheumatica, very often seen in older people, overlap, of course, with giant cell arteritis, very high ESR is part of it. Um, and uh, you can have fevers, low-grade temps. Now, the rigors, I still think, fit well with our kind of infectious inflammation, but I think that is a really important diagnosis to think about. Um, we're getting a comment about kind of just arthritis in general, inflammatory arthritis, like reactive. Now, um, I, I don't usually think of kind of reactive arthritis often in these joints. It usually is oligoarticular, um, but I've, I've always heard of kind of in the limb joints of the lower extremity. But I think that's a really important point to think of, particularly if this joint discomfort is in the post-inflammatory category, right, after this infection. I think the other thing I want to do is... Um, 
just almost think anatomically through the shoulders and the arms too, thinking about could there be anything in the muscle, right? We're seeing discussion in the chat about kind of a drug, a statin that can affect muscle, but it makes me wonder in his labs, do we need a CK, right? To look for kind of myositis or inflammation. It makes me wonder about bony pathology that we might not see, um, perhaps with um, bone metastases in the setting of malignancy, pathologic fractures. So I just bring up this musculoskeletal uh, concern that he has as notable, particularly because, right, we haven't seen anything in exam, right? He's not weak at all. Um, so on his sort of problem list, in addition to the fevers and chills, the positive urine culture, I think we have this upper extremity pain that we'll have to incorporate somehow. And I'm not quite sure um, how to right now. I don't know if you have other thoughts on that. Not really. And in fact, I was just thinking like if I heard that from a patient, the fact that Gurleen mentions it automatically makes it sure. <laughs> feel irrelevant. But if, if I understood right, Gurleen, like that discomfort only comes on during the fevers, but then goes away. Yeah, only during the fevers, like when he's feeling very fatigued, he notices just like the upper arm stuff. Yeah. Okay, so not I'll, constant. Yeah, I'll be honest. If I had that, if I heard that from the patient, I'm, I'm, I'm I think I'm about to be proven wrong and I'll learn from it. But if I heard that from a patient, you I would, make much of I might, I might toss it as just like myalgia from fevers. If it only, but, um, but I guess we'll, we'll see how it goes. And it's certainly, you know, with these questions, like your, your exam is free. It's immediate. It's fast. It, 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 and it, and it has no downside. So I think generating any sort of hypothesis that you can potentially quickly test, you know, on physical exam and then further triage to put away or, <laughs> or pursue is, is fair game. Let's get some more info. Yeah. Great. So for his um, lab, so his white blood cell count is 12.94, 68% neutrophils, 14% lymphs, 12% monos, and 5% eosinophils, hemoglobin 13.3, hematocrit 41, platelets 324, sodium is 133, potassium 3.6, Chloride 93, BUN 41, creatinine is 2.07. His baseline is around 1.5. His T Billy, D Billy, Alk Foss are all normal. ALT is 38, AST 51, albumin 4.2, total protein 8.6. He has a high sensitivity CRP that is greater than 300. ESR is 76. Ferritin is 830 and Procal is 0.15. His UA in the, in the on admission shows one plus blood, but no pyuria. He has a repeat urine culture in the hospital that grows 10,000 colony forming units, probable lactobacillus. Then he has some other infectious workups, a COVID influenza, basically get upper respiratory viral panel, which was all negative. His blood cultures are no growth. Test x-ray shows no abnormalities. He has a CT abdomen pelvis that shows no evidence of pyelonephritis or any other acute processes or abnormalities. Hmm. And that's what I have in this aliquot. I have two more aliquots after this. Great. All right, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Zavin uh, talk about one of his favorite topics, which is those EOs. Yeah, they shouldn't be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this guy is pretty sick. And sick people make cortisol, and cortisol um, suppresses the, the production of eosinophils and induces the apoptosis of eosinophils. Um, and if somebody is sick and they have eosinophils, you should wonder whether the eosinophils have to do with why he's sick. Cancer, hematologic or solid organ, parasitic infection, auto-inflammatory things, drugs, adrenal insufficiency, um, but the eosinophils matter. And what do you think about the uh, UTI now? Is this, is the UTI why he's sick? I don't think so. It's so interesting, right? We've got another organism now, lactobacillus, uh, a 
gram positive rod, um, still no pyuria. And I would expect, right, we've talked about how sick this guy's been for a month. We're now expecting this to be a complicated ascending infection. Um, we talked about how we don't need a CT to diagnose pylo. But at this point, if this was a GU issue, right, we should see some inflammation anatomically on our CT scan as part of this. So I think we really need to kind of start looking elsewhere, ultimately need to explain, right, these different organisms that are growing in his, in his urine but um, the money somewhere else. Yeah, um, we need an abdominal CT. Um, we got one. Oh, oh, we did. Oh, okay. Oh, heck. So no pylo or abscess or anything else that's wrong. Interesting. Okay. And no chest CT with that, but we have a chest x-ray that's normal. I totally blanked on the, um, the imaging. Hmm. Okay. So we're, we're quite far along and we still don't have a, have a good, um, um, sort of set of hypotheses. Does, um, does anybody want to like, I guess, do a problem representation and then, um, toss out some, some possible diagnoses they're, they're considering. I can try one. Um, so, 70 year old gentleman with, uh, I guess, multiple comorbidities, asthma, diabetes, and all that, um, who presents with essentially fever, riders, dysuria, found to have um, positive urine culture um, and elevate and eosinophilia on labs with negative with negative imaging so far i mean at this point i'm thinking that either it's a long-standing parasite infection that's now just decided to flare up or there's something autoimmune <sighs> heme malignancy rare but might be on the differential now, considering he's kind of old and autoimmune and uh, parasite infection probably would have popped up a little bit earlier if we would, if we were um, if we're thinking about those. I was I, like the one disease that I was thinking about that I know is like you know classic eosinophilia in, uh, in the diagnostic criteria is eGPA, but the symptomatology just does not seem right. So. At this point, I'm lost, and I think the next test that I might do is try and do a stool O and P and see what we might be able to find. Yeah, right. I think, yeah, we are really overlapping, Drew, the eosinophilia, right, being a signal here, and trying to think of, right, what are the inflammatory syndromes we would expect to see in both the infectious and non-infectious categories. So you mentioned malignancy, uh, particularly hematologic malignancies. Now, solid tumors can be associated with eosinophilia also, but I think we're absolutely at this point, right, in the case um, Gail brought up early, right, all these other categories of fever. I think we need a peripheral smear on this gentleman, um, probably need flow cytometry just to get a sense of what's, what's happening in the blood with some of this abnormal differential diagnosis. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gurleen, that's a mild monocytosis also um, for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have eosinophilia monocytosis in someone with, right, a subacute inflammatory syndrome with weight loss fevers. I think we start to have to working on the malignancy route and specifically hematologic uh, malignancies, I think, as a category. The other little lab signal that's, that's standing out to me is um, this ongoing positive blood. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Gurleen, it's, it's the heme pigment positive, but we're not seeing any red blood cells. I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just bring up that presence of the blood pigment, but no cells and the mild AST elevation he has 51, right? Barely above normal, but, but not normal usually of um, making us think about, right, what, what cells could be breaking down that are pigmented that 
could be showing up with this positive heme pigment in the urine and that specifically muscle and red blood cells. Um, so we've talked already, he's got some muscular symptoms that may or may not be related, but because of this mild AST elevation and heme positive in the pigment, I would check uh, CK. Exactly, now we're looking for myoglobinuria. And um, you know he's not anemic, but would just wanna make sure by getting, um, a, again, as part of our smear and other workup that there's no kind of mild hemolysis happening with this. Um, which doesn't seem likely with a hemoglobin of 13, but important to think about. Um, what else do you have for diagnostics going forward? Um, I would maybe get more information about the asthma and see if this was like classic childhood atopic or if it was a little bit more unusual adult onset, right? That's one feature of the clinical syndrome group that could fit with eGPA. Um, and the timing of the drug initiation, I don't know why um, Promise uh, made empagliflozin in red, um, whether it was because it causes glucosuria and can maybe predispose to, you know, genitourinary infections, um, or if, you know, we're sort of also thinking about the meds as possible allergic kind of triggers. Um, I would do a good exam and ask about any intermittent or transient um, skin eruptions, rashes, which could either support possible allergy or parasitic infection. People with, you know, schisto and strongy sometimes have um, uh, kind of transient um, kind of urticarial-like uh, uh, rashes that are another clue to, to, clue to the presence of the um, uh, worms. And, and then the other thing, uh, wait, why did I, why was I wanting a CT chest earlier? Um, I forget now, but um, anyway, I, I'm blanking, but there, there's, there's, you know, you, you can, you can imagine a few reasons potentially to, to look for any um, um, kind of inflammatory signals in the, in a lung parenchyma that may be, um, you know, that the CT just isn't a <coughs> sharp enough instrument to detect, um, but also to complete sort of like a lymph node, yeah. internal lymph node exam, right? When lymphoma um, uh, is on the, and other tumors uh, are on the differential that again, the chest x-ray just isn't always sensitive enough to rule out. Oh, I love this. The Fiesta mnemonic for eosinophilia. That's fantastic. Great list of organisms to think about. Very cool. Oh, aspergillus. That was the other thing. So does this person have, you know, a, a allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis that is now evolving into a potentially more That's invasive, semi-invasive uh, uh, form and thus causing systemic uh, inflammation? And so uh, in the interest of time and two more aliquots, let's, let's, let's get some more uh, data. Yeah. So the EOs are like the upper limit of normal and the lab is like five and for monos it's 11.7. So on his subsequent CBC the next day, both of the EOs and monos went down. So they were no longer kind of as slightly elevated as they were in the first day of presentation. Um, had some more infectious workup. So blood parasite smear was negative. Babesia, ehrlichia, anaplasma, Lyme, they were all negative. Chlamydia, gonorrhea were negative. T-spot, hepatitis panel, mono spot, CMV, PCR, syphilis screen were all negative. Urine histo was negative, HIV negative, tularemia, brucella, coxiella were negative. He had an echo. Um, I think the echo is actually earlier than all of this just because of the rigors and everything. No vegetations were seen. However, the aortic and pulmonic valves were not well visualized. Um, and then he had some autoimmune markers, had rheumatoid factor, CCP, ANA, Inca, which were all negative. Had an SPEP, which was negative as well. And CK was um, normal. He was, in the meantime of all of this, started on empiric doxy, unclear like what was going on with him. He had a full body PET scan after ID saw him in the hospital because of un unknown what's going on. And the PET showed no evidence of FDG avid malignancy. There was some patchy FDG uptake throughout the patient's muscles with no fluid collection. The report said findings may relate to inflammatory 
disease involving muscles, but recommend correlation with muscle enzyme and said possibly consider MRI of the patient's pelvis and thighs to further assess. This is what I have before the fifth aliquot. And then after the fifth aliquot, I'm just gonna tell you more of the course because there's more like outpatient stuff and then still kind of confusing, but then there will be a final diagnosis, but yeah. Wow. Um, please people uh, speak up, speak up in the chat. This is obviously a, a, a tough case and the diagnosis is gonna be, uh, you know, really, really cool, I think. <laughs> We've heard um, of a fever of unknown origin. This is a fever of very, very unknown origin. Wow, what an extensive workup. Um, so, so the, but, but the new information we get is the muscle signal. Yes. So someone had mentioned trichinella, um, and that is a parasite that can present with, um, you know, eosinophilia, fevers, et cetera, and has uh, sort of lives uh, oftentimes in, in muscle. Um, inflammatory, <laughs> um, inflammatory myopathies. Um, of course, the CK being the normal, you know, sometimes the, the uh, you know, inflammation or the degree of sort of injury, um, you know, is such that there's not like florid, you know, C CK elevation, but usually there's, there's weakness, right? Um, either, you know, either significant CK elevation or weakness or both, you know, maybe an aldolase would increase the sensitivity to detect milder injury, but I think overall would still be, you know, pretty non-specific, even if um, <coughs> the CK had been a little positive. And, and the presenting syndrome of just like fevers, urinary symptoms without any weakness, I, it just doesn't, doesn't seem like a, you know, like the right fit. Um, any other diagnoses that sort of like pop into people's heads with the muscle FTG avidity? One that, you know, I thought of was sarcoid. Steph, remember a couple of years ago, we were reading a CPS together and um, the diagnosis was sarcoidosis. And something I learned from it is that something like 80 or 90% of people with sarcoidosis have some degree of muscle involvement. It's usually clinically silent. Um, <coughs> but uh, if you do the right type of scan, and now I'm blanking on which scan that was, but you can detect this sort of muscle inflammation. And I, um, I wonder if, I don't think it was the PET scan that was recommended you know, by these authors, but um, I wonder if it's sort of the same, if it's the same signal. Hmm. Um, and, and then of course, um, you know, there's uh, the first, second, third layers of, kind of rarer and the rarer infections to look for. <coughs> uh, but there's always more rares. And if anybody has ever tried to do like a practice ID boards, you know, set of questions, you, <laughs> you, yeah. you see how just how many of those layers there are. So um, Nazazine, I thank you for reminding us, right? Just a little bit more about the social history that, that Grilling mm -hmm. gave us. He's uh, from India, came to the US 20 years ago. And then it sounded like he had had sort of northeastern United States travel, hence a lot of the tick-borne illness workup. Um, but I had forgotten sort of just about right where he where he had lived previously. I think that's an important thing to think about as we brought in our infectious diagnosis in particular. Um, realistically, I actually wonder if a muscle biopsy, um, getting a tissue, you know, tissue sample and looking for granulomatous inflammation, looking for organisms is gonna be a step that we go to. Um, but I'm curious if you guys want, can wanna even um, sort of Google, right? We've got some infiltrative inflammatory process in the muscle um, that's probably driving a lot of this. Um, Gurleen, just to clarify, was this avidity diffusely or was it in certain areas of the body? I think <laughs> maybe more in the thighs since the report had said, consider MRI of pelvis and thighs. What do y'all think about, nah, I was going to say, what do you think about giving this person 20 of prednisone and see if that like achy, Fixes everything. A, achiness of the, yeah, I think PMR is still hmm. on the differential. Hmm. Um, you know, a lot of vasculitides can 
or some vasculitis can come with eosinophilia. G GCA PMR is not one that I think of, but I, I also don't, I don't know. Gurleen, you want to give us the next aliquot? Yeah. So, um, so he was discharged since he wanted to follow up as an outpatient, kind of all the acute workup had been done. Um, he was referred to rheumatology on discharge, kind of unclear. ID thought that unlikely to be infection based on all of the workup that was done. So um, since he was discharged, when he followed up in rheumatology, he continued to have nightly fevers, peaked around 101, continued to have pain in his shoulders and hips and some headaches with the fever. So rheumatology was concerned about GCA, though like the symptoms were not typical. So they got a temporal artery ultrasound, which was negative. During in the outpatient setting, he had rising ferritin to 1,426, had some worsening of his AST, ALT, and an increase in neutrophilic leukocytosis. His platelets were also getting creeping up. Um, at this point, the outpatient rheumatology team um, also curbsided heme just to think about the ferritin going so high, like thinking about um, like HLH and other things. Um, the ferritin actually dropped back to the 600s without any therapy, so thought it was like unlikely to be that in this case. And then some other workup that rheumatology got included an aldolase, which was 12.6. The normal, um, I think upper limit is seven. Got triglycerides, which were normal. Got an IL-2 receptor which is around 3,000. I forget what the upper limit is in, our, in the assay, but I think it was like high. And then rheumatology started him on 40 of prednisone and that 40 prednisone did resolve his fevers, but he was still having some night sweats and did feel like he had increased energy after starting the prednisone. In terms of the muscle stuff, so rheumatology, um, I think at some point in the outpatient setting, he did have like some sort of consult I can't remember what team it is, but some sort of, I don't know if it was neurology or some, I'm not sure, I can't remember what team took care of this, but when they like assessed overall, they thought there was no utility to a muscle biopsy just because he has no weakness and no kind of symptoms that would fit it, even though the imaging did show like a concern for muscle stuff. And then that's what I have in this aliquot. And then the next one I have like, like more course and then just like the final diagnosis. Yeah. Um. I guess uh, Ala posted about just inclusion body myositis. If we think about our illness script for that, sort of building it together, happens in older individuals. It's as opposed to the dermatomyositis and polymyositis, it's usually proximal pain with weakness, though, as opposed to distal. Am I mixing that? Oh, no, I'm just I the reverse, it right? It's distal. Can someone fact check that for us? Inclusion bodies? Distal. Um, but doesn't have to have a dramatic CK elevation right. like That's the, the other others. Good point. <clears throat> um, the systemic inflammation is beyond really, what I expect. Yeah. And I, I see all of you looked at a reference about, you know, does eosinophilia associate with it at all? And it looks like it is, it is possible. Approximately. Thank you, Gail. Yeah. So, the, so his inclusion by myositis, proximal and distal. And so he's got proximal weakness. Or, or then, pain, sorry, I should and then say. The other, the other sort of unique thing of inclusion body is that it's less steroid responsive, although in this case, we didn't have that Total many response. symptoms to follow in terms of what would, what would have improved. Yeah. Um, but what, what do people think about this, um, the uh, triglycerides? Um, <coughs> and Gurleen, can you say the triglycerides again? And then the IL-2 receptor, what, what, what di diagnosis is that sort of in the context of usually? Triglycerides were normal. Triglycerides were normal. Does anyone know what the IL-2 receptor antibody is about? Sima, I think, um, ooh, that sounds familiar. I, I Yeah, um, I think it might be the same thing as CD25 or related, but... Um, yeah, Gail, um, I associated to, I think it's one of the kind of criteria of, of HLA hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Um, and um, what's that? There's a, there's a prediction, so there's a clinical prediction score. Um, I forget the name of, but that would be good to sort of like plug into. Can somebody, can somebody Google like HLH clinical prediction and then um, type in, you know, whatever information we have and see what the, that pretest probability is? I think one, um, 
important data point that we haven't seen yet that that might be clarifying is a bone marrow biopsy looking for any hemophagocytosis. And thank you, Seima, actually adding the um, <coughs> fibrinogen level might be part of that calculator as well. Um, so, so yeah, um, and it could definitely present with this, right, kind of insidious, systemic, inflammatory, nonspecific, you know, we're not seeing cytopenias, which are a common feature, you know, to, to have HLH without any anemia, um, I think would be a little bit unusual, but things also can evolve over time. But the LFTs, the fevers, certainly the ferrets and the IL-2, um, and, and obviously, um, in, you know, with exclusion of more common diagnoses, is important to kind of keep that context in mind. Um, so, so and yeah. He was evaluated in rheumatology. He did have a, anemia as well, like with the worsening LFTs. Like his mm. hemoglobin was around twelve. He mm. did. He did. I see. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think um, we we should probably uh, turn it over to Gurleen to kind of tell us what happened and um, and teach us what uh, whatever else she would like from from this diagnosis um, or from this case. Um, I don't, I don't feel confident in anything um, mm. right now, so I'm really looking forward to, to, to what, what happens. <laughs> to this yeah, I think it was, I think it's, it's challenging for all of the people who are involved in this case as well to kind of figure out what was going on. Um, so, given like the negative infection and kind of work up so far, no clear condition, um, rheumatology. In terms of like thinking about HOH, um, they were concerned about like possible macrophage activation syndrome with this elevated ferritin, AST, LT, slightly um, like anemic and the high soluble IL-2, but he didn't fit other features like elevated triglycerides, organomegaly, lymphadenopathy, and his ferritin was not extremely elevated. That's why he was kind of curbsided and they thought it was like against, arguing against HLH. So what was thought given like the negative workup, um, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, but diagnosis considering adult onset stills disease based on the criteria. So the Yamaguchi criteria for that, you need five um, criteria, including two major criteria. So the ones he met were fever of at least um, 39 degrees Celsius lasting at least one week, arthralgia lasting two weeks. I think they lumped the top, the muscle pain as arthralgia as in this um, instance when thinking about it, but he didn't have any rash. He did have the leukocytosis. He had no sore throat, no lymphadenopathy, no hepatomegaly or splenomegaly, which are some of the other minor criteria. Um, has the abnormal liver function test as an outpatient, which meets one of the minor criteria. And then the other minor criteria is negative tests for ANA rheumatoid factor, which were negative for him. Though no one's exactly sure if this is the diagnosis because there's it, it's a diagnosis exclusion doesn't really meet all of that. So as an outpatient, other things they were thinking about, as you all mentioned, was like thinking about like eGPA, like his history of asthma, though it wasn't really based on the history they got as an outpatient, didn't really think that was um, as likely. I think at some point they also thought about like infiltrated IgG disease. They got um, IgG levels and they were all normal. Um, when he presented as an outpatient, at one point he had some like inflammation in his parotid gland. So also had him see like ENT and have like some imaging of that area to think about is there some sort of like lymphoma in the parotid gland or some other sort of like malignancy and that kind of um, imaging didn't reveal anything. So he was given his like inflammatory markers were still pretty high, even when he was seen as an outpatient of the rheumatology, he was started on anakinra. Um, and he did see like his inflammatory markers got better. Initially, like he was feeling a little better, his inflammatory markers got better. Um, but then when he was on the anakinra, when the prednisone was tapered down, he physically got worse again. His inflammatory markers went up, he refevered, his CRP was greater than assay again. He was having some more headaches. So they repeated another temporal artery ultrasound to see maybe like just the initial one was negative. The repeat was still negative. And at that point there was low utility in getting a biopsy because he'd been on steroids for a while. Um, given his like prior PET scan with the thigh muscle kind of signal, got a myositis panel, which was negative. He had an auto-inflammatory genetic panel sent as an outpatient because really not really sure what was going on. And that didn't show any like thing that was positive. They sent a, a VEXIS gene, which is like this newly gene that was recognized a couple of years ago. There's a paper out in I think blood advances that it's associated with some sort of like auto-inflammatory and that was negative as well. Um, 
and just in terms of his course, his Anakin Rail also started to like not work um, a few months after, or like as after he was on it for like a month and he worsened. And at that time, um, they got like a peripheral a blood um, flow cytometry, rapid heme panel to evaluate for malignancy, which was negative as well. He had another PET scan repeated and that showed resolution of the uptake in the proximal leg muscles that was seen on the original PET scan. Um, and then kind of just in terms of treatment, rheumatology, um, got an IL-6 level, which was slightly high at 80. So he was stopped off of, he was tapered off the anakinra. He was started on colchicine and um, tocilizumab, tosi, um, and that improved his symptoms. He felt more energetic, no more fevers, like clinically doing better, and his inflammatory markers also came down. Ultimately, we don't really know what he has, some sort of multi-system auto-inflammatory disorder, it, could be adult onset still disease, but like not really sure. So I don't have like a clear cut answer for, for everyone, but um, I learned a lot from everyone's discussion today. Thank you so well, much. I learned a lot from the case, just some of the right, very advanced diagnostics, just hearing how the, um, the clinicians involved, right, move through all of the big categories of fever that we've talked about in a lot of cases. Really cool. Thank you so much, Kirlene. Um, Wow, I think uh, the I'm also just humbled at the, you know the extent to which so many incredibly smart people try to figure figure out what's wrong with this guy, right? Using so many incredible technologies, and we just like couldn't, right? And and that's just how uh, amazing and and com complex and humbling the the human body and our immune system um, are, and um, yeah, I, at, at least at least there are things we tried, right? Like based on guesses, and at least they brought some relief um, to, to this um, uh, gentleman. So uh, I'm glad that that you know um, uh, there was that. But uh, hey, if you ever have like more follow up on this guy please, please think of us and <laughs> send us a message and, and let us know because um, I, I don't think I'll forget this case. Thank you, Gerlein. Thank you to all of you guys, um, particularly those of you that are four for four for the VMRs today. It was really a privilege to be a part of this event and um, to be part of the CP Solvers community, particularly at a time like this when there's a lot going on in the world. It's just uh, great to spend some time with you guys and think and discuss and chat. Wonderful to see your faces on a Friday evening versus early Saturday morning, depending where you are in the world. Thanks again. Have a great night. Bye, everyone.